chapter of the book of Proverbs, and we are beginning our exposition at verse 27 with the hopes that we'll get through the chapter. Uh, I have in my hand a catechism uh, that I sponsored, didn't write, sponsored. Uh, good friend, many of you know Frank C. Uh, is a great student of the scriptures, a fine Hebrew student. Frank wrote this catechism and has been working on the project for some time. And I said to him out of frustration, Frank, what do I need to do to get you off dead center to finish this? And so, well, he needed some money. So this is my own project here. I'm the producer, director, not writer. Uh, I have three. I have a lot. So uh, anyone that has an interest, please let me know. I'll keep a stack of them here in the class. As I went through this, I said, my goodness gracious, this isn't just for children. This is for everybody. So this is part one. Leave them here and uh, let me know if you want more. Uh, Proverbs 21, 27. I want you to set a tab at uh, Genesis 17. I hope we get there today. If not, we'll do it next week. The sacrifice of wicked people is an abomination. How much more when it is brought with evil intent. A 28, a false witness will perish, but a person who listens well will testify successfully. Now, I know that's not your translation, so that's my job to clarify uh, that translation. Uh, 29, 29, a wicked man becomes brazen, but the upright discerns his way. Now there's a question here, what way are we talking about? Are we talking about the way of the wise? Are we talking about the way of the false or wicked man? It is his own way, the way of the wise. And that's the way I understand the proverb. Here's 30. There is no wisdom, no understanding, and there is no counsel that can stand before the Lord. And finally, 31, a horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory, success, achievement belong to the Lord. Okay, here's the way I'm going to teach these Proverbs. Here's what I think that they are, in effect, teaching us spiritually. The wise in heart are sincere worshipers. The wise in heart are sincere worshipers. 28. The wise silence the false witness testimony. The wise silence the false witness testimony. 28 is in a legal context, and it must be understood that way. We know that because of the word witness and because of the word testify. In the ancient world, you had judgments rendered always at the city gate, and you had controversies, disputes settled there. That was the ancient law court. And so, this is to give an official testimony. What we would call under oath in our culture. Raising our right hand, swearing on a Bible, and so forth. 29, the wise follow the objective Word of God. The wise follow the objective Word of God. And 30, the best of man is powerless before the Lord. 
The best of men is powerless before the Lord. Finally, 31, the wise prevail because they belong. The wise prevail because they belong. Okay, here's our exposition. The sacrifice of the wicked. The Old Testament sacrifice, particularly I'm thinking of the sacrifice of the patriarchs, the Bedouins before the law, they would take, slay the animal, they would take the entire animal and put it on an altar and burn it up, hoof and all, entirely. What's interesting about that is that that smoke that would come up and would catch the current and would go back and forth and swirl. Well, the Lord says that I smell that. It fills my nostrils and it is pleasing to me. That's mysterious, isn't it? Particularly in light of the fact that I really don't think he was smelling the sacrifice. I think what he was really alluding to was the intent of the heart. I get that from what David tells us in Psalm 51, 16, and 17. You don't delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. So David is saying that what is very important is not the animal, it is the heart that desires fellowship. And more about that in a moment. Now this is a how much more proverb, asserting the certainty of the Lord's rejection of hypocritical worship. The top line here is a repeat of Proverbs 15, 8, with the exception of the word abomination, which we have recognized as revulsion. The wicked is the hardened sinner. Thought, word, deed, selfish, self-centered. He has been and always lives with this in mind. Me. Me first. Theologically, he's called the autonomous man. The wicked man who determines what is truth and what is not. The judgments all come from his own heart. He is a law unto himself. Therefore, good and evil are never objective absolutes, but rather it's his opinions. I was listening to Ode to Billy Joe, Jenny C. Riley, uh, a week or so ago, and uh, it caught my attention. A, Billy Joe has jumped off the Tallahatchie Bridge and Mama brings them all in for supper and tells them this revelation. And the heart of the song is the, the dinner time and the conversation. It's brilliantly written. But what caught my attention was Papa. One line, Billy Joe never made a lick of sense. And I said, there it is. That's the autonomous man. No compassion, no care, no concern. And it's all about him. It's his opinion. What he thinks. Proverbs 28, 26. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. That's who Papa was. Now look, regarding this sacrifice, line two, he brings it, which is actually in the text a common idiom for an offering of worship. We see it for the first time in Genesis 4, 3. Cain, same verb, he brought to the Lord an offering. There it is. 
And what did he bring? He brought his best. Not what his parents had taught him. Remember, the man and the woman would walk with the Lord God in the cool of the evening in the garden. Now they're outside the garden. And in order for the man and the woman to have fellowship from this point forward, something had to die. Blood had to be spilt. And he, the Lord God, is the first to kill in his own creation. He killed the animal and clothed the man and the woman. It is a beautiful picture of the work of Christ clothing us. There it is. And you want fellowship with the living God? Something has to die. Blood has to be spilt. Cain didn't do that. What did he do? Brought his best. Well, best doesn't cut any ice with God. Your best, my best, doesn't, doesn't score anything with Him. He demands perfection. Not your perfection. His perfection. He never grades on the curve. No, He demands absolute righteousness. And so, this offering from this autonomous man, Cain, what he thought was best, was rejected. Even more sinister. Look, in the proverb, it says, with evil intent. The word here really is desire. We translated it craving in verses 25 and 26. Selfish, crass, with personal indifference. It's the pretense of piety, but of course, there's no piety at all. It looks good on the outside. But it is deceptive. This was a personal proverb, in my opinion, for Solomon. And here's why. Because it was the very activity of his half-brother Absalom. You remember? 1 Samuel 15, he goes to his father, the king, and asked to go to Hebron to fulfill a vow he had made to the Lord. In reality, he had gone to Hebron to stage an announcement that he had appointed himself the new king of Israel. And while he was at Hebron, 1 Samuel 15, 12, Absalom offering his sacrifices. He was, in fact, recruiting fellow conspirators and a cadre of counselors for himself. And then, when they gathered together, he moved on Jerusalem, the climax of a four-year plot to overthrow his father David. Here are the words of Arthur Pink. So he rose and went to Hebron. Absalom's duplicity and hypocrisy appear in all their hideousness. He cloaked his insurrection under the guise of an offering, a sacrifice unto the Lord in performance of a vow which he pretended to have made. But there was no fear of God, for he dared now to even mock that worship with a deliberate lie. That's Absalom. Look at the final words of the proverb. With evil intent. You know, I have actually heard from men's own mouth, businessmen, that they joined a fellowship, that they became a part of a church because of the business connections that they had. Amongst the cadre of parishioners were in fact the movers and shakers of their own opportunity. Evil intent. That's what that is. They're not there for the fellowship. They're not there for the gospel. They're not there for the full counsel of God. No. They're there to advance themselves. Evil intent. 
Here's 28. Notice, as I said, it's in a legal framework. You must realize that in order to understand the proverb. The legal testimony consists in this theme of the proverb. Now, the proverb damns the false witness and promotes blessing upon legal truth. Our top line, the false witness, is unique in all of the Proverbs. Here's why. 6.19, we had the lying witness. In chapter 12, verse 19, we had the lying tongue. But here, we have the false witness. So this is something different and new. The one whose aim and purpose is to deliberately deceive tied to the previous proverb, as you can see, and thus to disadvantage the innocent person. Now, in Israel, a witness had first-hand knowledge of a fact. I witness to an event. Here, being deceptive, the deliberate deceiver, the promise is to perish. God will bring judgment. To perish, a reference to death. Proverbs 31, the words of King Lemuel. Give strong drink to the one who is, and here's your word, dying or perishing. That's 31.6. The wicked, false witness, is a liar and thus condemned as a short-termer for this life in the here and now. Look at line two, but your contrast. Now we have another unique phrase. One who listens well. That phrase is dependent on our understanding of this final two words, testifying successfully. And as I said, that's not your translation, so let me give a bit of time to this without digging too deep in the weeds. If you have an English Standard Version, a King James, a New American Standard, your translation is different. The NIV is testifying successfully, which is what I am purporting to bring. The translation here refers to listening and listening in a constant and uniform way, and therefore the wise person can render a good judgment. And it's a good judgment against a false witness or false testimony. First, to testify. This is the same word that we have in chapter 18, verse 23. It's the same verb, and there we translated it to speak. The poor speak. In 1823, the NIV says the poor plead. The same for the English Standard and King James, the poor entreat. And if you have a New American Standard, there you had the poor utters. The point is that the verb in this translation is always speaking. So thus, we have testifying. One in the same. Now, it's the second word that is a bit more cloudy. It's the word successfully. This word is used 31 times in poetry. 26 times it means forever. One can find a reason for that idea uh, in speaking endlessly. So you have some type of nuance in which that is your translation. Endless, ongoing testimony. If you go back to Proverbs 12, 19, the English translated the word ongoing into the future. 12, 19, the top line, truthful lips are established. And here's your translation forever. So it gives you the idea of something 
ongoing into the future. Now that makes a lot of sense to us as believers because we give testimony and we remember that. We remember those words that were said. They are ongoing. They live today. The things that I have heard said from the pulpit have stuck with me, and I can even quote them. We know it for a historical fact. Words like Patrick Henry's, give me liberty, give me death. That's speaking, that's testifying on into the future. That's the idea. I think the contrast here in the proverb is about silencing the false witness permanently. And the wisdom, the skilled one, is one who listens, who has paid attention, and respects the truth. Thus, his words, his testimony, are lasting. They carry more the idea of victoriously prevailing. That's the idea of success, or successfully. Now, let me give you this word. It occurs in a legal format, and I think you will see how it's used to make sense in the proverb. The word is found in Job 23.7. You don't need to turn there. Let me just give you the context. It's a very emotional text. Job 23. This righteous man, this great man, has undergone this tragedy, this horrible suffering. And his friends have all come to comfort him. But after a while, they grew cold toward him. They listened to him say over and over, I have examined my heart. I've examined my life in every way I possibly can. And I am innocent. And I do not deserve the suffering that has been afforded me. And his friends concluded, no, you are a great sinner. You are self-deceived. You are blind unto yourself. And you deserve everything you get. So you come to Job 23, and it's in a legal context. It is all about Job bearing witness to himself. And what's so emotional about this chapter is he is bearing witness to the living God. And he's crying out in his frustration and his anxiety, listen to me. If you would just listen to me. And let me tell you, let me tell you how righteous I have been, that I have confessed my sins, that I have walked in your ways. Then he concludes, it's 23-7. I will bear witness. And then, after doing so, I'll be successful. See, that's the word from our proverb. My testimony is so sound, so pure, that I'll be successful if I could just get him to hear me. It's a great passage. The witness in the proverb speaks the truth. He listens attentively, carefully, and therefore, when he speaks, he testifies successfully. In the final analysis, he's going to prevail over the false witness, which will bring about a righteous conclusion, a just vindication. That's the proverb. Here's 29. A wicked man becomes brazen. Your translation may read bold-faced. I think the King James hardened, hardened, face here, line two, but the upright, he discerns his way. The immediate recognition here is the contrast in the top line from the wicked man to verse two, the upright man. Now the proverb opens with wicked, 
we have again seen this word. We just saw it. Imprudent, self-centered, shameless in his behavior, without compassion, and he becomes brazen. Now, notice brazen. We're not going to skip over the word become because there's theological truth in the word become. The book of Proverbs teaches us that there's nothing instant. You see, we're all moving, never in neutral. We're either becoming wiser or we becoming more and more foolish. Psalm 1, verse 1, teaches us that very clearly. We're first walking, we're taking up the lifestyle of the world, the ungodly, then we're standing, we're becoming stationary, never fleeing. No, we are gazing, we are participating, that's the idea, and finally we're sitting. That is the wicked mocker, hardened, unreachable spiritually. The word brazened here is interestingly used of the promiscuous woman. Proverbs 7, 13. She seduces the young man. And it's all in the context of performing a religious ritual. This woman is hard. When uh, I went to my son's graduation, 2005, Two days. First day, we had the keynote speaker. We went to the football stadium. And the keynote speaker at that time was Democratic Senator Barack Hussein Obama. And I listened. Never heard him before. People went crazy. I stayed seated. I told my wife he didn't say anything. <laughs> the next day, we went to a smaller venue, and it was the school's and the school's presentation of the graduate of that particular college. Well, we got into the auditorium, and here came the cadre of, of the faculty and then the keynote speaker. And when she got up, she was a graduate of the school, and I instantly recognized her. She was I said, she's on television. And uh, she had graduated from that particular school. And matter of fact, she announced in her speech that she was retiring. The subject of her message was how to maintain your balance in a hectic world. What she did was she got up every morning Six o'clock, lit a candle, and meditated. I thought, this is interesting. I started taking notes. She said, you've got to go inside. And uh, there you will find your balance point. And it will help you to think through your day and make right decisions for life. Now, friends, nothing could be further from the truth. I don't need to go inside. The Scriptures already tell me that my heart is desperately wicked. That what I need is the objective Word of God. That the New Testament tells me is a mirror. It shows me for who I am and what I am. It shows me for all my faults and all my wickedness. I don't go inside. I go outside. Outside of myself to hear His Word speak to me and render its judgment upon me. I left that auditorium. This woman was Jewish. Uh, that means somewhere some generation back, some place, some heir of hers held a Torah. And how far she's deviated from that. The objective Word of God. 
I said, that woman is hard. That's what you have in this. The contrast, but the upright. Term means being straight. The man or woman who displays a consistent conduct that does not go astray discerns his way. His lifestyle, her lifestyle, is characterized by moral discrimination. That's the idea in your translation. It says something like giving thought to one's ways or your new American standard makes one way sure. So it's the careful decisions, directions that one gets from the Word of God that inform me how to make those decisions daily and it culminates into a wise walk. Here it is in the New Testament. The Apostle tells Timothy, 1 Timothy 4.16, pay attention to your doctrine and to your life. That's Proverbs. You see, whatever you're feeding your mind determines your thoughts. Whatever determines your thoughts manifests themselves in your deeds. And your deeds determine your destiny. It's a daily walk. It's a relationship. And it is always before the Word. Here's 30. There's no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel. Wisdom comes from the Lord, enters the heart through the Word. And notice this is the Lord. That's the covenant name. The name of the burning bush that displays His power in and through the life of His own people. Proverbs 24, 5. A man, a woman of wisdom has great power. So, our top line opens with wisdom to live successful life powerfully to the glory of God And here is the negative in contrast. No wisdom, no understanding. Understanding, we've seen that word many times before in the Proverbs. It is know-how. It's how I know to do what I do with some form and skill. A few years back, I taught Proverbs uh, Psalm 49. The sons of Korah speaking about death and the shortness of life. 49.4, it's a wisdom psalm. And the sons of Korah say, I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will understand. There it is, know-how. My riddle to the music of the lyre. In other words, Psalm 49.4 His music will be the means to revealing the wisdom. Listen to my song and you'll learn wisdom. That's what he's saying. Line two, no counsel. That's the best of human thought. It's used in 2 Kings 18.20 for war strategy. When my wife was diagnosed with malt lymphoma a few years ago, We went down to MD Anderson and all the files and the tests and the blood work and everything had been sent down there. So when we walked in, we exchanged pleasantries with the doctor for about 20 seconds. And then he says, now, here's what we're going to do. It's a strategy. And that's the idea of counsel. This is the best of human thought. And what we do with counsel is we pray. We take the best of human thought and we pray. And we seek the Lord for His guidance and direction over that thought. Look at these three words, that can stand. That phrase is one that marks human ability. Psalm 147.10, that is the leg power of the paltry man and before 
the leg power, the legs of the torso, the strongest muscles in the body, and the psalmist says they can't stand before the Lord. That's easy for us to understand. The voice of the burning bush crushed the Pharaoh. He humiliated Egypt. Despite what the kings and the princes and the rulers and the political forces of this world determine, He is going to come, Psalm 2, and He is going to establish His power and rule over the earth. And there's nothing that man can do to stand against Him. All of their power, so-called paltry power, will not prevail. Here it is, Isaiah 8.10. Isaiah 8.10. A great classic verse for this phrase. Standing. Devise your strategy, but it will be thwarted. Propose your plan. And then here's our word. It will not stand. Same word. For God is with us. Here's our final proverb. 31. Horses prepared for the day of battle, but success, victory, belong to the Lord. Psalm 33, verse 16. Give us a great background to this proverb. The king is not saved by the size of his army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. A war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great strength, it cannot rescue. So, with all this human power, how can we possibly prevail? Here's what David says. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him. And those who hope in His Hesed, His covenant faithfulness. He'll never let us down. This war horse is a powerful animal. And atop him is the military man giving him a distinct advantage in battle. And it serves as an example of human ingenuity. Line two, the contrast is the human initiative with the Lord's final word, which brings about success. Of interest is 1 Kings 10.26. Solomon brought to Israel the use of a mounted warrior militarily. And so, here's the word prepared. It is the Hebrew word to fix. Used in Psalm 11, verse 2, the bow that has the arrow set, fixed, established to the stream. Notice here, it's for the day of war. Time here, day of warfare. Now the contrast, line 2, but... Success. It's actually the word deliverance. And specifically, it is salvation or deliverance by God and by God alone in the Scriptures. Now, here's what's exciting to me. Look at that word belong. It's tied to the Lord and let me show you what's exciting about belong. That's why I want you to set a tab, Genesis 17. Genesis 17, this is the covenant that God made with Abram. And that was an exclusive covenant. It was a belong to, our word from the proverb, covenant. It was exclusive. It belonged to two parties. Abram and the living God. 
You got to get your brain around that. Okay? That means that it's not for the Moabites, it's not for the Edomites, it's not for the Philistines, not for the Egyptians, or any of the other ancient races. Look at Genesis 17.21. Those words, three words. But my covenant. He had Ishmael in the mind of Abram. Abram is saying, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Here's my strapping boy, Ishmael. 1721, but my covenant. It's only between two. Abram and the living God. And look, I will establish with Isaac. You know what the real zinger to that is? Isaac hadn't even been born. Isaac wasn't in space and time. I don't need to go to Romans 9 or Ephesians 1 or any other place in the Scriptures to understand God's selection of a believer. I go right here. Here it is. And here is the excitement for you and me. We are heirs of this exclusive, belong to covenant. Paul tells us that in Galatians, that we are the children, the seed of Abraham. We are his adopted children. We are participants in the exclusive covenant. Now, if that doesn't thrill you, I don't know what does. When I got my brain around it, some 25 years ago, I jumped out of my skin. And here's how it all comes together. See the word Lord? That's the name of the burning bush. Let me tell you something about that name. That name determines all outcomes even before the events in space and time occur. Now we know that because we just saw it in 1710. But here it is in Exodus 3.19 to amplify what God has just said to Abram regarding Isaac. Exodus 3.19, this name declares, out on the Midian desert when Moses is standing with a stick in his hand and in the midst of sheep. I know that the Pharaoh will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, and I will do it, and then afterwards he will let you go. He determines all outcomes because his word is creative. Now, Practical application for you and me? Romans chapter 8. Paul says, what to you and me? We have been predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. I'm going to make it. I'm actually going to make it. And so are you. The power of the sovereignty of God and His all-pervading providence over your life. Are you down? Are you discouraged? Don't be. You're the winner of life. And you're the winner of history. We belong to Him. And you know what the proverb says? We're going to prevail in His power. That's what we do. Not our ingenuity. Nothing that we bring to the game. No, it is Him from start to finish. 
and He will take us home and it will be a great victory for all of us. Praise be to God. That's the proverb. Let's pray. Thank You, Lord, for our time of study this morning. Thank You for the Word of God as it speaks to us as believers. Lord, bless those who hear Your Word today in not only this hour, but the hour to come. And may they hear the voice that calls them by name, the Great Shepherd. They hear it and they follow it. And they prevail all through life, through many dangers, toils, and snares. We have already come and You will safely guide us all the way home. In the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.